So I woke up today at 4.20 this morning, <laughs> undesirably, unexpectedly, <laughs> and uh, couldn't quite get back to sleep. Um, part of it's just, you know, I have uh, back issues that make my sleep always has been problematic for a long, long time. But, but this Ravi Zacharias stuff has just been on my mind a lot. And so I woke up and I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about this stuff. Uh, we recently got the report the other day, and this video is not going to be about the topic, but I'm just... I'm going to open up by telling you guys, giving an announcement about this because it's really heavy on my heart. Um, long story short, Ravi Zacharias, major exposure of very serious, very, very serious, you can't hardly exaggerate it, um, sin that has gone on and it's complicated, it's hard, there's been a lot of victims, we care about them. And on Monday, I'm going to be doing a video dealing with this in detail. Um, I'm gathering information, I have been gathering information for quite a while, I kept silent on it because we didn't really know, we didn't really know what the facts were you know, about this stuff. And at least I didn't know. Some people did and they were convinced I didn't know. And now, now I know and feel compelled to talk about it. So that's coming on Monday, Monday at 1 PM. And I wasn't going to do a video at all this week on Monday, but instead I'll prepare and we'll be doing that. We'll, we'll dig deeply into the topic and talk about uh, Ravi Zacharias and this stuff that's going on that we could have an honest, take it on the chin reality check dealing with what's going on as well as a responsible Christian response to it because no one should be stumbled by this, but many are. So we'll talk about that. But what I would like to do right now today is Friday Q and A is take your guys questions. So here we are, we're talking about your issues, the things that you're bringing up. You're sending us questions right now in the live chat. I will put timestamps in the video description later so you can kind of jump around and find exactly the things you're interested in. I'm Pastor Mike Winger. My goal, my agenda is to help people learn to think biblically about everything because I truly believe that the word of God, the Bible is more brilliant and beautiful and life changing than just about anybody realizes, sometimes including me. And so we're heading in that direction of learning to think biblically about stuff. Here's the first question. This comes from Doug Bush, who asks, if Revelation was written around 70 AD, why wouldn't John say anything about the destruction of Jerusalem? Wouldn't he write about a prophecy of Jesus that came true? Pretty big event to ignore. Um, so I think that th what inspires this question is perhaps the fact that I just recently have been dealing with the issue of eschatology, right? I did um, six Christian views of eschatology of end times in a recent video. Then I talked about um, Mark 13, you know, evaluate a preterist approach versus a futurist approach to that particular chapter. And one of the issues that comes up here is, yeah, when was Revelation written? Because if you're a preterist, if you think that the majority, not a, not a hyper preterist, but just the normal variety of preterists who, who are not heretics or anything, right? If you're a preterist, then you think that most of the book of Revelation, most of the, the prophecies have already been fulfilled, right? We're still waiting on Jesus to return. We're, we're still expecting a, a, a resurrection, resurrected body and all that. But if you take that view that Revelation 70 already happened, then most preterists, Revelation 70, Revelation, the book already happened in 70 AD, then most preterists are going to take the view that the book was also written before 70 AD. So Doug's question is this, um, if it was written late in the nineties, why doesn't John mention the destruction of the temple in revelation? And that's, that's actually, that's a good point. This is actually one of the reasons why people would say revelation was written early. They'd say, John never mentions the destruction of the temple. Um, it, it's, it may be that it was just that long after, um, I'm just giving you a response possible response. If John had written in 72 AD, it may have been fresher on the mind, but if he writes 24, 26 years after the destruction of the temple, it's so much in their awareness of everybody that perhaps is not needed to be written about. That may be the case. Plus, let me just add this. My own thought here is that John is writing a vision. He's not recounting his thoughts, right? So like if, if he was writing his own book and he's referencing the temple, like in Revelation, he references the future activities of, of a temple, you would think he would naturally then take a sidebar and talk about the destruction of the temple. Maybe not because it was so far after, but also he's not writing his own ideas. John doesn't really take sidebars in the book of Revelation. He's getting revelation from God. He's seeing visions. He's recording those things. He's just faithfully, he's just writing down the stuff he's experienced. And so um, he may not have had opportunity to write a sidebar issue. Let's talk about how the temple was destroyed. Um, yeah. Now you can view, you could still be a preterist and think that, that the book of revelation was fulfilled mostly in 70 AD. 
you would then look at Revelation as recording history. It's a vision of what has already happened and mostly and then a little bit of what will take place. I think that's very challenging because a lot of the preterist teaching is based on the idea that Revelation are things that must shortly come to pass. And if they're things that have already come to pass and that seemed to conflict with one of their key like, you know, reasons for supporting their view. So that could be a problem. Um, but yeah, it, on, on the flip side, as a as a futurist, I could have an early book of Revelation. Revelation could have been written in 65 AD or something. And I could still be a futurist because I do see a partial total fulfillment thing going on there. So I'm, I'm, I would be open to an early date for Revelation. It's just that the vast, vast, vast majority of scholars right now, which doesn't mean they're right, but it is something to think about. They think Revelation was written late, not early. And for the most part, from what I understand, only preterists think that it was written early. So, you know, your view happens to need an early writing for Revelation and your view happens to be the only people that think it was written early. The The job is on the preterist to prove the early date at that point, I think. All right, question number two, um, Lace Bacorni says, do we have free will? If not, how does that affect God's sovereignty? If we don't have free will, how does that affect God's sovereignty? If yes, if we do, how can we be punished for sins when we had no other option? Um, okay, let me try and field these. Um, I'm I'm very firm in the camp of you have free will, right? I, I think that that is demonstrably true. I think it's intuitively true. And I think it's biblically true. I think it's taught across all of those spectrums. So um, let me give you an example. Here, let's go to Genesis chapter 4. And we'll talk about Cain and Abel. So Cain and Abel did not get along. Let's talk about the biblical side of, of free will here. Um, let's see. Abel, they bring the different offerings. God does not respect Cain's offering. He does respect Abel's offering. And Cain, it says here, was very angry and his face fell. And God responds to him. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now, sin, we know, is this is a desire that comes from within. Each one is tempted to sin, James says, when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And Jesus is here, God is here encountering uh, Cain and telling him, hey, look, you have a choice to make here. You should choose to reject and turn from that thing and do the right thing. Now, that that instruction to do the right thing doesn't make a lot of sense without free will. And this is kind of what we get throughout the Bible. If there isn't a decision, at least, now you're talking about free will entirely. You, know, you could be, a, you could actually be, for those who don't know, you could be a Calvinist and affirm that Cain had free will in that scenario. He just doesn't have free will in regards to the gospel, in regards to receiving uh, the love of God and, and embracing the truth of Christ. Okay, so that let, I'm going to set that aside. That's not what I'm talking about right now. I'm talking about the question of free will in general. The Bible from Genesis 3, even after the fall, so you can't just say free wills before the fall, there's a there's a free will decision relating to sin after the fall, and we see it over and over and over again, constantly. It's just assumed that you have a choice to make and that you are then responsible for those choices. So that's biblically. Intuitively, I think we have free will, right? Because it's just, we're hardwired to think we have free will or something like that because it just seems like the most obvious thing in reality. Of course I have free will. Like if you never take a philosophy class, you will think you have free will most likely. And then if you encounter some smart person who who can talk you into thinking that you don't have free will, that's fine. Um, atheism tends to think there's no free will because they're atheists, not because they generally, in my opinion, actually are against free will. It's, it's a result of atheism, right? With no God, they can't account for free will. So they say there is no free will. But everything about us intuitively says, hey, I've got free will. And then there's the philosophical arguments um, for the idea that you've got free will. And I'm not going to try and get into all that today. But the um, person you can look up for that is Tim Stratton. Tim Stratton's like the free will guy. And his uh, website is free something. <laughs> Just look up Tim Stratton. You'll find him online. Sorry, Tim. I do not remember right now. It's free. The freed thinker. No, that's not right. I don't remember. That might be right. I might be thinking of somebody else. 
again, I woke up at 4.20 this morning. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm fading already. Um, okay, so so do we have free will? I'm going to say strong, confident, absolutely we have free will. I absolutely think we do. I think it's biblical, intuitive, and philosophically supported. Um, I, and I only need one of those <laughs> scripture to, to convince me, but I think it's all there. Now, if we do have free will, you said, um, how can we be punished for sins? Or, or, oh, if, okay, how does that affect God's sovereignty? That's your question, if we do have free will. Um, how does that affect God's sovereignty? Well, I think that it, it, um, it gives us perspective on God's sovereignty. It shows us that what God, when God is sovereign over all things, that includes sovereign over allowing us to have a certain amount of freedom to choose things. And parents do this all the time. So a parent decides like what kind of things are brought into the kid's room, what toys they're allowed to have or not have. The kid picks what toys to play with. The parent puts food on the on the plate, and as the kid gets older, you know, then they're they're told what the, you know you need to eat that food. When you're a baby, they feed it to you. When you're older, eat that food. Maybe you'll get punished if you don't. But you're going to make a choice. And as parents watch their kids grow, they give them more and more and more choices and less and less and less control. But they're still like there still is a control. Like, you know, you take the car out, you go out, be back by this time. If you're not back by that time, I might ground you, I might take the car away. But I'm, I have a sovereignty and there's free will within there. I think it's it's very simple in my mind. I, I Maybe it's weird that I don't struggle with this issue at all. Um, I don't know why you struggle with it. Just because God's sovereign doesn't mean God is causing everything to happen. It means he's ultimately in control above and beyond all the things that are happening. And he has a plan that incorporates all the decisions you're ever going to make. And he's going to make sure that his ultimate plans come to pass. But part of his ultimate plan is for you to make free will choices. So you and me choosing to accept or reject Christ, God, his will in one sense is he wants you to accept Christ. But it's not his will for you to accept Christ under duress or without freedom. It's, it's his desire that you'd accept Christ willingly. And so for those who reject Christ, they're in a sense out of God's will. They've rejected Christ, but they're in his overall plan that they would make a free will choice about Jesus. So I think that there's the interplay there between God's, God's plan, his sovereignty involving you making free choices. I don't really see a problem with that. Um, and I have a hard time understanding those that do, to be completely honest, the more I've thought about it. So I, I hope my answer helps. I'm not trying to make light of a struggle that someone may have. I, I'm just trying to invite you into my process as I work through this. Um, yeah. Now you said, what if we don't have free will? How can we punished, be punished for our sins? I, I agree that that's a little confusing. If I make a robot and the robot's function is to like shoot flames all over the house and start fires. And then later I'm going to punish the robot and beat it up because it's doing this. Th that is strange. Um, yet there's one rescue for this, which is, well, it is still a bad robot. Like you still got to do something about it. You know, even whether it had a choice or not, it has to be stopped. So I would say if we have no free will, we should at least be stopped if we're doing evil, whether or not we can be punished versus just stopped. That's a struggle. I, I agree with you there. That's a moral struggle. Um, now it, that being said, I would choose to trust God beyond my own understanding if that ended up being the case, but I wouldn't have a choice in that anyway, so you couldn't get mad at me for it. <laughs> anyway, uh, Linda Caswell says, as a conservative Christian, is it wrong to enjoy new age music? I enjoy playing and listening to the relaxing piano music, but if it's connected to new age, I do not want to disrespect the Lord. Um, Linda, I, I'm a bit of a, at a bit of a loss here. I don't know what new age music means. If you mean um, new age as a genre of music that has certain like sounds, like maybe it's like wavy synthesizer on the piano or something. Um, okay. But wavy synthesizers don't carry spiritual connotations. I don't think, but if it's also carrying with it words and teachings that are blasphemous against God, okay, that's a different problem. So I'm going to say if it's a genre of music, just like rock is a genre of music, I don't think that it's inherently wrong right? Not, not the sounds themselves are inherently wrong. I think new age, if it means like wavy synthesizer sounds, I don't think that's inherently wrong. But if you have lyrics and messages that are coming across that are ungodly and blasphemous, then, um, yeah, I, I, I understand thinking, yeah, this is probably something I shouldn't enjoy. I shouldn't be partaking of. And of course the enemy, you know, wants to couch sin in the most appetizing package as possible for us so that we do yield to more and more sin as we enjoy our entertainment and we live in an entertainment culture more than ever before I, right i mean the disciples like never watched any tv shows 
They didn't see TV shows. They didn't have to ask themselves if that Netflix program was appropriate or not or if they should pay Netflix Netflix money or not. They didn't have to make these decisions because they weren't in that kind of entertainment culture like we are. So I do think we have to make these honest, real choices. Um, but yeah, that's where I would draw the line. Now, the only music that I've heard where I felt like genre really did have a moral implication is genres of music that are really strongly steeped in rage or violence. And there, and there are... If you guys are familiar with different genres, there are some that there's something rage filled about the style of music. It's as though someone said, let's find all of the sounds that seem to correspond most closely with anger and let's make music that way. Um, I think that there is a potential spiritual pitfall there. I don't want to judge people too strictly on this because I'm just trying to make a good moral judgment and I don't have total perfect clarity on this. But. I'll put it this way. If you're listening to music that stirs up unhealthy, ungodly, or carnal things in, in your life, whether it's sexual or, or anger, wrath, bitterness, if it's doing that, then it's very bad for you. And this affects teens a lot. Teens will get lost in their music and they'll be listening to their headphones for hours and it can just be stirring up rage, um, bitterness, loneliness, suicidal thoughts. That is a, a real problem if that's happening, of course, but... Hope those things are somewhat helpful for you. Um, we do need to be careful what comes into our minds and hearts because it comes out in our lives. Letty Fernet has a question. From a Christian perspective, do you have any advice on dealing with and overcoming the fear of death? I've been experiencing a lot of anxiety over my own death and my loved ones. The fear of death. Scripture is pretty clear on this. Um, let me find the verse for you. Hebrews 2.15, that what Jesus came to do was deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. There's a kind of bondage that comes with the fear of death, with the knowledge that humanity is marching ever onward. You know, you have one less day in your life on earth than you had yesterday. You are inevitably heading toward, you know, when I see a loved one on a deathbed, I think, I, I mean, this is me. I think this way. I think one day that'll be me. One day that'll be me on that deathbed. And I wonder how, what my attitude will be. And will I be, will I have the composure and the trust and the faith that I hope I have as a Christian? And one way you can do this is to recognize that, like, this is the very, this is, this is Christianity 101, that Jesus came to save you so that, as he said, when Lazarus died, he goes, he who believes in me will never die, right? He will, he will live. And Getting this truth into our hearts and into our minds is the beginning and the end of Christianity. That Jesus has given you life. That if you believe he died and rose again, then you know that your death is is just a passing into his presence. To be absent from the body is then for us to be present with the Lord. And I realize I'm, I'm not quoting scripture here. I'm summarizing the teaching we get from when Paul said that he knew he was well pleased rather preferred to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord because that was what he believed. He believed when he was out of this body, he was going to be present with God. We are delivered from that fear of death. Now there is another fear, right? And that fear is, but what if I'm going to be judged? And so we can actually get this other fear that connects with this. Um, and this is where 1 John 4, 18 comes in. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, this is really interesting. This is, this is I think, talking in 1 John 4 about a Christian who's truly a believer, who is fearful about being punished, about their future standing before God and being punished. They're, that's what they're afraid of, that they're not going to survive. They're not going to make it to heaven, basically. Um, and this is because they're not perfected in love. And you might be thinking, oh, this means I'm not, walk, I'm not loving others enough. And there may be a relationship there. But it ultimately starts, we love because he first loved us. So the lack of perfection is there is perhaps, as you look at death and you think about your own death, there's a, a lack of an awareness of God's incredible love for you in Christ. You know Jesus died and rose again, and then you need to understand God's posture of love towards you personally. There's a historical fact, he died and rose again, but there's a personal reality. He did it for me. He did that for me. And you need to absorb that and believe that and trust that as it relates to death. Death is, our attitude towards death in some ways is our attitude towards the very gospel itself. And you may waver in some sense here. I don't want to condemn you for that. Actually, I want to remind you that 
you perhaps are fearing because you haven't been made perfect in love. And then, um, you know, our hearts can condemn us, but God is greater than all things. God is greater than all things. And he, he um, in fact, maybe let me bring that, that verse to you as well, because I think it's, I think it's beautiful and related. Um, 1 John 3, 20, we'll start with 20. Yeah. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. So you're, you're, we're often condemned because not because we know our lives are in rebellion to God or we're, I'm falling away. I, I, I don't really trust the Lord. It's not like that. We're condemned because we're just scared. What if, right? It's just like that kind of fear you have where nothing's actually wrong, but something might be wrong. And so you're just scared. That's the kind of my heart condemns me. I, I'm afraid of death because I feel condemned over my sins, but God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. Instead, a healthy, mature Christian is, you know, verse 21, beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And that's what we want to graduate towards. A heart that is uncondemned because you know the, the fact of Christ's death and resurrection and the reality that it was also for your heart and for your life. And um, I hope that those things help. This is, this, is, this is basic Christianity stuff, man. This is just basic stuff. I, I really hope, and that doesn't mean you're simplistic. No, no, this means this is, this is the bread and butter. This is the essentials. So I hope it, I hope it gets to you. Crystal Peck says, how do you view the false prophets, prophecies of Trump winning pride, a lying spirit, spreading the same false prophecy? Do we stop listening to all those who claimed this? Oh, I am so grateful for this question, Crystal. <laughs> um, how do I view the false prophecies of Trump winning? Um, first off, I think Trump lost the election. Um, let me, let me see something even more special, more particular, more careful. Trump was not given a second term. Why is that significant? Because there were these prophecies in, in 2020 that Trump would have a second term. Now, some try to rescue this by going, well, he technically won and that was stolen from him. But the prophecies weren't that he would technically win. The prophecies were that he would get a second term, which means they were wrong. Okay. They were wrong. That's the first thing I would say. I do. I view them as being incorrect and having been wrong. Now your question is, how do you explain them? Is it pride? Is it a lying spirit spreading the same false prophecy? I mean, it could be a lying spirit. It could be pride. It, it could be, um, I've, I've criticized in the past, the sort of hyper charismatic circles where they so want prophecy that they discourage really testing prophecy. And this causes people to prophesy whether it's true or not and to feel rewarded, even if they're wrong. And so I think that this leads to an environment where you have people competing for the office of prophet and to be like the better prophet. Oh, this one prophesies better than that one and that kind of thing. So they really want to get out ahead of things and prophesy them and be shown to be prophets. This is pride. In addition to that, when they see all, all their peers prophesying something, then they feel more safe getting on that bandwagon and prophesying the same thing. In addition to that, there is a devoid, there is something devoid of the work of the Holy Spirit in that so many people who were supposedly men of, men of God were caught completely off guard in that they didn't, not only did they not know these were false prophecies, right? But they were even giving the false prophecies about Trump's second term. What does all this tell me? It tells me that in the circles where these men and women are operating and being lifted up as authorities, there is some kind of spiritual cancer going on in those circles. I don't know a better answer than that. I mean, is it demonic? I wouldn't be surprised. Is it the Lord chastening them to, to put them on display as the false prophets that they, that they are or false prophesiers? There's a whole debate right now, by the way, is do we call them false prophets or people who just prophesied falsely? And I'm like, either way, I'm not listening to them anymore. <laughs> That's all I need to know. Now, on a side note, I wasn't listening to them in the first place. Okay, call it what you want. But, but many people, including myself, including many of you, you saw these people and you thought, that doesn't seem very right to me. I have a lot of reservations about that particular person, that ministry, that way of behaving. Um, I'm just going to like set that aside. I don't want to call them false when I don't know the details, but Lord, I'm not going to trust those people. And boy, am I glad that that was my posture, that I wasn't one of those making, I don't have to go delete my videos now from last year where I was prophesying things that were false. Oh man. So what do you do? Do you stop listening? Absolutely. So anybody who's been propped up by, look, we, we just have to take this stuff on the chin. Okay, I don't have to be angry about it to be honoring God in this, right? Anybody that has been propped up by a ministry as a prophet who prophesied falsely about 2020, you have to stop listening to them as though they have any sort of insight into the Holy Spirit. You have to. You've, you've got to. 
This is a big, big deal. Here's your chance to find out that they're false. Now you can ignore the rest of what they say. Now they may repent because a lot of them now are spinning and they're trying to recover. And what I see is a lot of work being done to say, hey, everybody, y'all know I messed up, but don't worry, I'm still a prophet. You can still basically trust me. Or others um, even doubling down and making things worse. Oh, Trump, yeah, he's still going to get into office. Like, I, I, you guys need to trust, trust God's word, trust what God has said. And I'm like, No, I'm not trusting you as you tell me what you think God said. I, I'm, I'm trusting what God actually said in his word. And this is the attitude I recommend you guys take too. Sid Roth's show. Sid Roth is is a YouTube channel um, and, and a TV show. And he has a website and all this kind of stuff. He's on Facebook as well. And countless individuals who were propped up by that show prophesied falsely, came back, doubled down, tripled down. Sid Roth doubled down, tripled down, said, I believe this is going to happen. It's still going to happen. Don't lose faith. You absolutely have to trust in what God said over and over and over again. If nothing else, it means these people are not to be trusted. And that includes Sid Roth. And that includes the people on his show. It doesn't mean they aren't sincere. I don't care if they're sincere. You can be sincere and totally misled and misleading. So there's my, there's, how, you know, if you wonder how I really feel, <laughs> that's, that's it. Every every reasonable Christian, everyone to, who cares about the authentic work of the Spirit needs to set all of those people aside. That's it. Randy Loxley says, Mike, really appreciate your ministry in a futurist view of the end time. Oh, let me, sorry, let me say this real quick too. If you're listening to me and you're one who falsely prophesied about Trump's thing, here's what I encourage you to do. Repent of what you did. Recognize it was you, not the Lord. Do not try to maintain your status as some sort of prophetic person. Just stop. Get humble. Become a child in the Lord. Stick to the word of God and do not trust your own reasoning anymore. Don't try to find a path back to prophecy. Just humble yourself. There's something wrong with you. And only humility will fix it. It feels really mean. But I, I think it's what's needful. Um, all right, let's look at the next question. Uh, Randy of Loxley says, Mike, really appreciate your ministry. Thank you, Randy. Uh, in a futurist view of the end times, which current country do you think would be would best represent Babylon? So Babylon could be a city or it could be a country. Um, I'm going to give you some options. It could it could be in. I mean, I'm currently don't lean this way, but it could be in I Iraq, right? Because that's where Babylon is. So it could be coming out of that in the future. Um, Babylon could. Some people would think it could be actually Jerusalem itself. Um. I'm not super favorable to that view, uh, personally. And guys, this is not my super highly studied opinion. You're just asking my thoughts, okay? Um, I tend to think that Babylon is either Rome or something like Rome. Like it'll be a, a future sort of united headquarters of like a of a multi-government world structure, okay? That, that would be Babylon. That would most likely be that. Some people have thought it was the U.S. at times, that sort of thing. So you might look at the place that's having the effect of Babylon or Rome. Um, the, the effect that, say, Babel had in the, when the Tower of Babel was going on or of, that Rome had in the first century, that kind of effect of unifying and leading in wickedness that was going on in those times. So I'd be open to this being any sort of world kingdom where there has a, a sort of central location that sort of represents all of their um, unity apart from Christ. That would be my my thoughts, and others would probably understand it way better than me. Just giving you my thoughts. Nathan Johnson, number seven, says, what is your advice for a young adult who wants to start a ministry platform similar to yours, but who doesn't have any formal training? I want other young adults to care about theology like I do. Nathan, my, my advice to you is um, go for it. Um, is that your first videos and your first content, whether it's podcast video, is probably going to take a lot longer than you think to get traction, and that's okay. You're just building a backlog of content. And later, if you are successful, if you gain traction, people will go back and watch that content then. So stuff that you feel is worthless or, or not worth, if it's worthful, worthwhile, it's just that it's not getting views. You feel like it's not having an impact. Later, that stuff can have an impact. But it's like you build a backlog, and then you and while you're doing that, you're also honing your skills. You're getting better and better at doing it. You're learning how to do, say it's YouTube, titles and thumbnails and descriptions. And um, I've learned things like I do a series. And then later I go, wow, that was exactly the wrong way to do series. I should never do that again. I should do it differently. Um, you, you get better and better and better. And the ball rolls faster and faster the longer you do it. That's that's my advice to you. It, it's, it takes a very, very long time. 
lots of patience. I'd also encourage you, um, you have lack of training, you say, okay, yeah, you can still do it. You can still do it. Here's the thing. You need multiple sources, not just one. Don't just read one. Don't just quote a pastor that you like and say, okay, I just trust them. I'll just, I'll repeat whatever they say. Don't just quote me. Um, what you need to do is look at multiple sources. This is going to help your lack of training because one of the things that training gives you is it gives you access to various viewpoints so that you can help push against your own views and help find out if you've got something that needs to be changed or shifted or even just to be aware of some other views. Um, so I would recommend multiple resources on every topic. There isn't any, I can't just name three resources for all things in the world that you can look at. You just have to keep looking and digging. I also would recommend that you only speak as, as firmly as you can fairly be confident about an issue. If you don't know an issue, just don't hold that much confidence about it. Just say, I don't know. Don't pretend you know more than you do. And just move forward in that fashion. I'd also recommend this. If you want it to be like, here's something I've learned over, over time. And even some of my older videos, I wasn't doing this. And I, and I feel bad about it. Is if you're going to speak about somebody you don't agree with, try to talk as though they're listening. Like imagine somebody from that camp or that circle is listening to you in the room while you're speaking and it will change the way you approach them. You'll approach them with more grace. You'll look to build bridges instead of just burn buildings um, as you do that. And I think that that would be another piece of advice. So yeah, I, I think there's no reason why you can't go for it. It just takes a lot, a lot of work uh, if you want to do what I'm similar to what I'm doing. Angela Juarez says, if God is omnipresent, would his presence also be in hell? Um, well, the answer to that is basically yes, but... It's yes, but so um, let me uh, let me take you to a passage that um, talks about this. Psalm one thirty nine. So this is a this is actually a psalm that talks about the omnipresence of God, right? But it's in relationship to His knowledge. Catch this. This is interesting theology stuff. His omnipresence here is in relation to His knowledge. So search me, O God, and know my heart. Title here we put on the psalm. It's, he says. Oh Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. So you see how there's, it's the knowledge of God. You search out my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. God knows everything we're doing. Even before a word's on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. So, and God is also in control. So he's not only aware, he's also in control. He's guiding, he's protecting, he's helping. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. The things that God knows. It just, it just blows, it makes me feel stupid when I think about the things that God knows. Then verse seven, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? So you're asking about where, where God's presence is. If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. The Sheol is the grave, right? And, and wherever it is that you go when you die, Right, would be a reference to Sheol as well, depending on the context in the in the Hebrew there. Um, and God's there too. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, your right hand will hold me. I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and light and the light about me be night, even in the darkness. It is not dark. Or even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. So there's this idea of God's um, omnipresence that also connects to his, om his all-knowingness, his omniscience. We're just getting the attributes of God. Okay, so why do I say, yes, he's in hell? But, well, so God's presence is in hell in the sense that he is aware of all things, including the things that are taking place in hell, which I don't think anybody's in hell at the moment. I think in my understanding of theology, nobody's there currently, right? There's, there's, a, there's a different place. Hades, you might refer to it as. And I do think God is there, but not his felt presence. And that's the big but. His felt presence is not there. So God's his presence universally is in all places at all times throughout all the universe. Every location there is that's a location. He's there. But his presence isn't felt in those places. When his felt presence is there, there's an awareness of him. There is a sense of the very presence of God. That's a different experience. And this is something we get when Moses is on the mountain and God's passing him. And he's, he sees, in a sense, sees God, sees part of God, you might say, and his face is like glowing as a result. That this is, this is a different thing altogether. So that would be my, my answer. Yes, but uh, God's omnipresent. That's why his presence is in hell, but he's not omnifelt <laughs> presence. Um, there's other manifestations of his presence that go beyond his omnipresence. And let's see, question nine, the Christian metalhead 
He says, hey, Mike, can you help me understand why Paul would permit Timothy to drink wine for his sickness in 1 Timothy 5.23, even though it seems that he was under the Nazarite vow, number 6, 1 through 4. Um, let's see. Let's go to 1 Timothy 5, 5.23. Um, actually, first, let's read the number 6. Let's go to the Nazarite passage first, and then we'll try to answer this. I'll give you the best I can come up with here. Number six, one, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when either a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, which is not the same as saying you're from Nazareth. <laughs> These are different things. Um, to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar made from wine or strong drink and shall not drink any juice of the grapes or eat grapes fresh or dried. So nothing that comes from the vine. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, not even the seeds or the skins. Now, he does this for a vow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read on. There, there's more to the Nazarite vow. Uh, but here's what I want you to notice so far. is that it's, It doesn't say it's lifelong. Because it's here, all the days of his vow. It, it's, it's a temporary thing for the most part. No razor shall touch his head until the time is completed for which he separates himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. He shall let the locks of his head grow long. And then finally after and there's more but finally after his um he he's finished with the vow he cuts his hair as part of that vow now you might be thinking of samson he did this vow and he broke the vow but his vow was lifelong and that was placed on him by god it was not a typical nazarite vow it was more than that it was nazarite but it was lifelong it was meant to be his entire life god himself put it on him to never violate it never end it if timothy was under a nazarite vow it could end he had either declared, I'm doing it for this long, or he just declared, I'm doing a Nazarite vow, and he hadn't set an end point for it. And then Paul's perhaps counseling him, okay, it's time to move past it. But I'm not convinced that Timothy was under a Nazarite vow. In 1 Timothy 5.23, um, he says, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So there's nothing here about it's time to end your vow. All we know is that Timothy didn't drink. Now, why didn't he drink? Uh, maybe because, like Paul says, that like, hey, if it's going to cause someone to stumble, I won't drink. I won't eat meat. I won't drink. I won't do any of that stuff. And so there's a recognition that some people have a, have a conviction about it. Maybe Timothy as a leader wasn't doing it for that reason, to bless others. Maybe he wasn't doing it because he'd seen alcohol abuse in his family at a younger age, and he just, just didn't want to do it because of that. But Paul then's like, hey, you got issues. <laughs> you got issues with your stomach. Um, perhaps because Timothy's a missionary and he's drinking water in various locations away from where he was raised and different water has different bacteria. And so maybe he's like, drink some wine too. This will help. This will help. That, that seems very plausible to me that what Paul's getting at is just the water is causing potentially Timothy stomach issues and a little bit of wine with it will help kill the bacteria or help in some fashion. Yeah. So that there's my answer. I don't think Timothy was under a vow in that sense. Um, this is another one of those passages that like, those who think that all drinking is wrong um, have to figure out why this isn't really wine. And they'll try to look at the words and try to talk about Greek and it's all baloney. Like, it's just wine, guys. I don't drink even today, but that's, that is alcohol. And it's not a sin to drink alcohol, unless for you, it's a sin to drink alcohol. In which case, for you, it's a sin. <laughs> that's it. Um, it is absolutely a sin to get drunk. I like how he says, a little wine, if you notice there, <laughs> a little wine. He's not talking about getting drunk or something like that. Let's talk about number 10, Zoe Abundant Q. Oh, the Q is just the question. That's not part of your name, is it? Zoe Abundant says, uh, in Galatians 4.27, who is the desolate referring to Sarah or Hagar? My Bible study disagreed and I can see arguments for either. Ooh, let's look at this together, shall we? And with our powers combined... This is a Captain Planet reference. This is the cheesiest cartoon from my childhood. Um, Galatians 4.27. Actually, I was a little beyond childhood. <laughs> For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud. You who are not in labor for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Um, so the, before we move on to the greater passage I, I i probably should spend like at least 10 minutes just studying this because I, I don't know that i've thought about a different option than sarah as a as a as a picture 
here. I never thought of it as possibly being a Hagar, but um, at any rate, um, the children of the desolate one will be more than the one of the one who has a husband. Um, it, what's interesting here is that the desolate one, it seems like she initially has no husband. So I could see why some people would point that towards Hagar now that you point that out. Um, let's look at the overall example. Paul the Apostle gives us an allegory from the Old Testament. Tell me you who desire to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Here's the allegory, right? Abraham, he couldn't have kids. His wife was like, hey, um, go be with Hagar, the servant woman, and have a kid. And then that'll be, God's promise will be fulfilled through that kid. And God does not honor this. Um, ultimately, the Lord's like, no, your wife, Sarah, is going to have a kid. This was like, we often think of this as being an act of the flesh. This was trying to accomplish the promises of God through a carnal means. Um, and that may be very accurate as far as interpretation. Um, so then he finally has a kid through Sarah. Boom. So you got a, the child of the slave, child of the free woman. And Paul's going to use this as an allegory. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, right? That's descendant. Of Abraham, yeah, he's physically descended from him, but the son of the free woman, Sarah, was born through promise, right? This was because God said you're going to have a kid, and that was the child of the promise. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children from, for slavery. She is Hagar. That's the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law leads you into leads you into slavery, right? It's the bondage of do or, or die, um, and it, you have to obey this, and whoever does not obey all that is written in the law is under a curse. So it leads us towards slavery bondage now that now hagar is mount sinai in arabia she corresponds to the present jerusalem for she's in slavery with her children hagar is just like the current jew who rejects the gospel of christ rejects the messiah doesn't look at the promise but they're still trying to work according to their flesh to to obey god and, and achieve with their goodness their righteousness but the jerusalem above is free and she's our mother for it is written now, who's the mother in the next verse? Well, the last mother mentioned is Jerusalem. That's interesting. The Jerusalem that's above. Well, we find in, in Revelation this idea is the um, the ultimate city of God, the the kingdom of God where God and men dwell together because Christ has brought us together. So it's talking about those who are part of the this, this Sinai covenant with Moses versus those who are part of the new covenant in Christ. That's the main parallel. Verse 27, for it's written, Rejoice, O barren. One who does not bear, break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Um, man, I, I really would like to just go into this passage, Isaiah 54, 1, it says, and study that one more. I don't want to take 20 minutes answering a question, though. So I'm just going to say hesitantly here, maybe we shouldn't try to push whether it's Hagar or Sarah. That would be my hesitant interpretation where I'm hanging out right now. Don't try to push that it's Hagar or Sarah. Go back to Isaiah, look at what is going on in Isaiah and realize that Paul is probably drawing different threads together from the scripture. And he's basically talking about how um, there is this idea of of breaking forth and crying aloud and rejoicing, even though there was previously barrenness. And so we're talking maybe about like life out of death in the same sense that Christ brought life out of death instead of Sinai, which leads to death. Anyway, I would compare the New Jerusalem to Sinai and look at verse 27 in that context as a starting point. The next question is from somebody. It's very important. Ah, number 11. Skirt Bop Cat says, who can baptize? Can I baptize my kids? For some things, God did not give us clear instructions in Scripture. I don't see any rules about who can baptize in Scripture. So I don't want to make those rules, but I do see some stuff that I'll share with you, right? When we do see baptizing in scripture, while there isn't a rule, there's a precedence, right? The disciples of Jesus did the baptisms. They, they did the baptisms. Um, Paul, when he was out there and he was preaching the gospel, he didn't, however, do all the baptisms. He often had other people that did baptisms while he was preaching. They were doing baptisms. And so it wasn't like the guy who was sort of like the leader of the church has to do it. Paul was the leader. He was the number one leader when he was out doing his missions work. He didn't do it. Philip, uh, he evangelizes the Ethiopian and he baptizes him right there. My general thought is this, if possible, oh, one more thing to consider is that baptism relates you to a local body of Christ. You're not just baptized into Jesus. You're baptized into the body of those who were in, G in Jesus. You know, you're, you're part of a family. 
So I do think baptism is meant to be a public, local community event. But that doesn't mean it has to be once every six months or, or year when your church gathers for baptism or not at all right now because of restrictions. And so I would at least try to have some community. Here's my things. Have at least some community there for the baptism. If possible, the spiritual leadership of the local church would be there as well. If possible. But if for some reason you can't get that, they're not available. They're not, they're like scheduling something a year away and someone's given their life to Christ today. Um, then just get some believers together and go do it. Whether it's you as a dad or it's your friend or it's whoever, I think the baptism is more important than the person who's doing the baptism. So I would just say, go for it. Yeah, you could baptize your kid in that regard. I, I wouldn't see a problem with that. I don't see any restriction against it. Um, I would like the leaders of the church to be there. If I had my druthers, I'd be like, I'll baptize my kids, but I'll, I want the pastor to be there too or something like that. Now, we, I like that. But I don't think we have these hard and fast rules. And and maybe the reason for that is because there's a principle of, of its local, its community, and you want spiritual leadership there. That's a good principles to have. But it's also flexible because real life is so random and real life involves so many wild and unpredictable events that it's nice that we would be able to respond to those events and get in a bathtub one time. <laughs> or even I would pour over if you were if there was literally no way to do a baptism of, of by immersion. I would I would pour and I wouldn't think it was any less valid. All right. Number twelve, Steve Carruthers. Why is it that big name Calvinists in general are super arrogant and ultimately unloving? And shouldn't this disqualify them from leadership and make them false teachers? Steve, I am going to push back on what your characterization is of big name Calvinists in general. Um, let me give you the names of some big name Calvinists. Uh, John Piper, R.C. Sproul. Um, I don't see these guys as super arrogant and ultimately unloving. I think that there are some Calvinists that are arrogant and unloving and there are non-Calvinists that are arrogant and unloving and both, you know, might try to point at the other side as you're like, you're the most arrogant, you're the most unloving. Maybe there's a truth in that. That's possible. Um, there is a nature of Calvinism where when you, when you do get involved heavily in Calvinism, it can be tempting to look at the rest of the church like you have this super essential obvious truth that they all don't get and so this can breed a sense of superiority like it's possible but this could also happen to an arminian who's a more educated one who looks over the calvinists and they're like the fools you know so yeah um i don't want to judge calvinism based on the behavior of calvinists anyways i personally would like to judge calvinism based on the text of scriptures that are used to support it and ask is this true? Is it biblical? And if it is, then, and, I, and I'm a Calvinist, then I want to just be a humble and godly and loving Calvinist and be a good example. Um, I think that that would be a good thing. So yeah. Uh, recently in our time, there was this whole like young, restless and reform thing where there was like a season of some Calvinists, newer Calvinists who were kind of um, blunt, <laughs> to put it one way. And I think that this, this, spread amongst their followers that same attitude of bluntness and and the sort of firmness of theology of proclaiming this fact this fact this fact which is which can be very good when you're right but when you're right about everything it becomes potentially a breeding ground for arrogance and th there's that problem as well which maybe is a more recent phenomenon Number 13, Justin Harcherick says, Hi, Pastor Mike. Should I stop reading the devotional on my Bible one-year plan? It seems to be eisegetical and groups the old, new, and Psalms and Proverbs daily reading under one common theme each day. Um, yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, if you think that the way that it's, because just the way you pull verses together, you could actually produce false interpretations. That's absolutely true. If you think that this is happening on the regular um, in, in your one-year Bible, I'd recommend finding a different one-year Bible or Bible reading plan. I think that seems pretty pretty straightforward and wise to me, Justin, that you're like, yeah, why why would I be reading these texts out of context, placed into a context that makes them seem to say something different than what they seem to say? <laughs> That's a good call. I, I think you're making a, sw a smart choice. Silas Borner has a question. Can it be argued that the authority and power Jesus gave to the tw to the 12 and 70 disciples in Luke 3.15 and Luke 10.9 
to heal the sick and cast out demons is different from using our spiritual gifts? Probably. Um, so Luke 3.15. Yeah, let me think about this. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, that couldn't possibly be the verse you meant. And Luke 3.15 sounds way too early in Luke. I would think 7 or 8 maybe. Um, would you hate when you were like, you just type the wrong number? And he goes, no! <laughs> okay, well, he sends out the 12 in Luke, and I'm just spacing on exactly the verse for it. Um, he sends out the 12 and he also sends out the 70. He does give them authority to cast out demons, uh, heal the sick and to preach the gospel. Now in the new Testament, when we get lists of spiritual gifts, I don't know any list that includes casting out demons in particular, right? We have discerning of spirits, but I don't see casting out demons as a gift. That's interesting. We do see gifts of healings. And so that would seem related to spiritual gifts. That phrase gifts, plural of healings. That is related to a spiritual gift, um, but it may or may not be something that sort of rests on somebody typically. I also would recommend that we recognize that the apostles were not the, were not the model that every Christian was expected to follow exactly. I mean, in character and in faith, absolutely. But in mission and in enablement, no, I don't think so. So let me then say something that might be a little more nuanced. You could easily say in Luke you know, when Jesus sends out the 12 or sends out the 70, that they are given a spiritual gift at that moment. And that it's just different. It's just not the same spiritual gift that everybody is going to be given. But there's one additional problem with that perspective. Um, it seems to me that our spiritual gifts in the New Testament after the resurrection of Christ are based upon the work of the Holy Spirit that comes after Pentecost, the indwelling of the Spirit. That this is, again, what is leading to the spiritual gifts. And what they're doing when they go out um, in the name of Christ before Pentecost, it seems to be flowing from Christ giving them authority. I tell you this, and then in a sense, he's the one doing that work and it's an authority thing. Whereas in the New Testament, it seems to be an enablement thing. Um, and, and maybe I'm off base on this, you guys, please just consider the possibility. I might change my own mind later that, that what happens in the gospels perhaps is more about authority and what happens in the new Testament in first Corinthians, we read about in Ephesians, we read about in the various passages that talk about spiritual, spiritual gifts, that, that those things are more about enablement than they are authority. Now, if it's enablement, not authority, authority is like, you can just proclaim this thing. It's going to be done. It's going to be done. If it's enablement, then you don't get to control it. It's as the spirit wills, you're responding to God wanting to do those things. You're not just running around with the authority. Like Kenneth Copeland is probably the most obnoxious example of this. Uh, someone claiming to, to do it based on authority. Something to think about. Perhaps I would change my mind. I sure hope I'm not mistaken there. Um, it's not a thought I've had a chance to marinate on for very long. Um, Lawrence H. says in Matthew 11, 22 through 24, Jesus says, if Sodom saw and heard the miracles you have, they would have repented. So why didn't Jesus do those works in Sodom instead of destroying them? Um, this is, let's take, let's look at the passage, Matthew 11, 22. And let me just throw this at you guys. Um, because I present myself like I'm a question answerer and I am a, a convinced Christian. I like, I really believe this stuff is true. I really believe that, that the, the Bible, like God inspired the authors of the Bible so that he would give us this intricate message of the truth of Christ. And there's the answers to our, our life issues are found in the scripture. Um, not the answers to every issue humans face, but the answers to all the major and the biggest issues are found in there. The, the, the solution to death, all these things are there. And I believe it's evidentially true that you can support the truth of, of scripture and the truth of Christianity with evidence. That doesn't mean I have the answer to every possible question. So I will always do my best, but I stopped being anxious about thinking I have to actually have the best answer for every question quite a while ago. And it's something I would, I would recommend. Let me, let me go back to the scripture in a second. I would recommend this peace of mind to every Christian who wants to defend the faith. You don't know everything. And if you realize that, it's somewhat calming. You do not have to have every possible right answer for every possible question. It's okay, right? Because you saying, I don't know, does not mean Christianity is false. What it means, let's be very technical here, it means you don't know. 
and that's it. And then you go to bed. All right, so um, let's look at the passage. But I tell you, it'll be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable for Sodom on the day of judgment for the land um, for the land of Sodom than for you. Okay, so the to understand the context here, Jesus has just gone around the cities of Galilee and now he's calling them out. He's like, I did miracles. I did these things. You rejected me. It's going to be worse for you than for Sodom. Okay, that we understand. They rejected a greater revelation. Jesus himself in their presence, they had the prophecies, they had the scripture, they had the miracles, they had God with them and they still rejected him. Sodom didn't have all that. So whatever they did reject, whatever light and truth they rejected, it wasn't that that elevated it. Their responsibility is lower because their, their ability to respond was lower. But then there's the puzzling part where Jesus says like, hey, if what I did in you was done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. Now, let me just say this. If Jesus had gone to Sodom and had come in the days of Sodom, how would life be different? Well, for one thing, you would have very little evidence of the life of Jesus. So, because we have to look, there's consequences. God has to, has to take actions in reality. And the decision about when and where Jesus shows up is a very important decision. If he shows up back in Sodom, if he shows up back in the days of Lot and Abraham, then this puts him so far back in history that we will not have very much evidence for the resurrection as we do today. It puts him so far back in history that we're not going to likely have as many manuscript copies of the New Testament, of the Bible, in order to verify these things. It also puts him back so far in history that Jesus is showing up before the prophecies about Jesus have showed up. So we don't have prophetic confirmation about Jesus. If he shows up in Sodom, then he doesn't show up and meet Peter at the Sea of Galilee. Then he doesn't show up and, and meet the little girl who he healed, right? And he tells her, little girl, arise, and he brings her back. He doesn't show up to, to raise Lazarus from the dead when that time comes. So there's, yes, it would have been better for Sodom, but there would have been ripple effects throughout time and history that would have probably caused a lot more harm for a lot more people. When Jesus did show up and where he showed up was brilliant. Um, if you look at the population growth maps of the world, he he's basically more people have lived since Jesus, his death and resurrection, than lived before. So as time goes by, as years go by, more and more people are hearing the gospel and it and it, and it has to do with that key moment of when and where Jesus came. He came when the codex was just has just been invented and the ability to, to spread writing further and faster than ever before was finally available. Not only that, he came when the Romans had built roads to create quick travel opportunities for missionaries in God's plan to be able to bring the gospel very fast and very far. So if you had to pick a strategic moment in history to come, Jesus picked a good one. There's, um, there's some, some thoughts on that. Um, oh, here we go. All right, the next question comes from Joel Parks, who says, in your marriage videos, you referred to men as knuckleheads that, were, that weren't acting as the head in decision-making. Is it permissible to actively consult with and make decisions with your wife cooperatively? Absolutely, Joel, definitely, man. I think you may have misunderstood me. Um, there's nothing wrong. And, and, and everything right with talking with and consulting with and getting the advice and counsel of your wife and, and weighing it extremely heavily. I do that all the time, all the time. I'm preparing a video Monday where I'm going to respond to this Robbie Zacharias stuff. I talked to my wife about it this morning, went on a walk and we're sitting there talking about it and she's giving me advice, right? Cause she's like, I know you, I know how you mess up. Let me tell you some advice. <laughs> and so that's, I'm not being a knucklehead. I'm just being wise to listen to her. Um, I think that it's okay for wives to make decisions. The thing is, can the can the husband be the person who has that overruling authority in the home to use it properly and in a godly fashion? And I think that that's important to have in the home. And I think, I don't remember the context of me saying knuckleheads. I use that phrase every once in a while. But I think what I would call a, a guy who's, who's abandoning his responsibility, I'll put it this way, is one who out of fear won't make any choices. And so he puts everything on his wife so he can feel like he's not really responsible for what's happening in the home. I see this happen sometimes. You take care of it so I can just not feel like I'm responsible for that decision. It's on you, not me. And I think that that is an abandonment of responsibility. Um, there's my answer for you, Joel. Uh, I Yeah, I definitely don't think there's anything wrong with consulting your wife. Um, 
Yeah. Chantel Robinson says, am I a covenant breaker if I agree to a divorce that I did not want? My wife is divorcing me. Um, and I told her that we need to go to counseling first, but she doesn't want to fix the marriage, she said. Um, here's the problem. My problem, not yours. My problem is that I know so little about your life and your situation and the stakes are so high in your situation and I'm about to speak to it and try to give you advice or counsel or tell you what to think about it when I don't really know. And I know from having had many, many counseling sessions with people is that when they try to summarize their situation, that's never enough info. I have to ask questions. Like if we got together, I would ask you questions for like an hour and just listen for an hour, which is why I can't do this for everybody. And just listen for an hour. And I would just listen, listen, listen and gather all the data because then I would go, okay, now I know what's going on. So all I can recommend right now is go check out my marriage and divorce Bible study. You've probably already seen it, but maybe not. It's that big three hour video. You type Mike Winger, divorce and remarriage. It will pop right up in the, in the search engine and you can check this out. I, I'm, I go through so many different specific principles and teachings and examples and that I think should equip you to be able to answer this question biblically. I think it should. If you're going to force me to give you counsel based on this tiny little piece of info, I would say fight for your marriage with everything you've got in a love fight with love, right? You put so much love and care and self-sacrifice and owning up to your own issues and changing your own, your own self, whether she changes or not, and seeking to rebuild that marriage or restore that marriage and trying to involve anybody you can that you think might help and you don't give up, but I don't know your details. And so forgive me, please, if that counsel is somehow offensive because I just don't know this stuff. Question number 18, Amelia says, does the Bible teach that we can feel God's presence or is it just human emotion in response to our minds receiving biblical truths? Wow, that's a fantastic question, Amelia. Let me just survey my mind that's been up since four. <laughs> There's a scripture that specifically comes to mind about feeling God's presence. I mean, there's a scripture in the Gospels that says that, um, I think it's in John, that the presence of the Lord was there to heal. The power of the Lord was there to heal, but they were not, um, what, you know, they were not believing. And so it didn't happen. Um, in the Old Testament, we have passages that talk about the presence of God um, coming and having an impact on the people around them, right? The, 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 so for instance, with Moses, when he's in God's very presence, he his face glows afterwards because it's just glory oozing off of him. So there was obviously he felt something, right? Um, although he didn't know that he was still glowing at the end of it. But there was some kind of experience that was going on there. We also read about um, God's presence in the temple such that the people couldn't work. They couldn't do anything. They just were like almost, almost like a, so much... I want to say oppressive, I, that has a negative connotation to it, but there's something heavy about the idea of God's presence in that context. And it doesn't mean it's always going to be like that. We also read about how the disciples were filled with the spirit and we don't read about their emotional state, but we read about how they went out and spoke in tongues. Um, we also read this in Romans eight. I'm just surveying scripture here about God's presence with us that by the spirit, we cry out Abba father. Now that's interesting because here's a relational term, Abba, a sense of sonship daughtership that you have with god i'm your i'm your child and it's provided by the spirit there's a sense of that involves an emotional content i think generally then there's also that the holy spirit helps us when we need to pray intercedes with groanings that words cannot express which means that here i am in prayer and i'm groaning and the holy spirit's communicating my heart to god and so there's an emotional aspect in that relationship as well so all that to say um, it's, it's probably not a black and white issue. You could get emotional because it's the Holy Spirit. You could get emotional because it's, you saw a cartoon and it was emotional. You could get emotional because you didn't eat enough that day. You could get emotional because you're having hormonal imbalance. You could get emotional for lots of reasons, right? And it can also be the Holy Spirit because your emotions, if your emotions can be tugged at, by watching a commercial that makes you go like, oh, like, why can't the Lord do that by his spirit? There's my answer. I wouldn't, um, I would not encourage people to obsess over whether God's presence is there. This is, this is where I would say, don't go. If, if you're worshiping and you're like, 
Lord, I, I really feel like your presence is here right now as I'm praising you, as I'm worshiping. Oh, the goodness of God. I'm just aware of your goodness. And then later you're worshiping and you're like, I'm not feeling it. So I guess God's not here. Okay, that's a little silly because you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You're just, sometimes your emotions aren't getting pulled because we're weird like that. So Amelia, I hope that that helps you a little bit trying to do some on the fly survey of various passages. Um, Hugh Seeger says, what advice... Oh, by the way, let me just pause and say one more thing. Um, Galatians says not to walk in the flesh. And the flesh, it has desires that go against the spirit. To walk in the spirit and that the spirit has desires that go against the flesh. Meaning that the desires to, to like love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, self-control. Those desires find their root in the Holy Spirit in a Christian. So when you have a desire to love a desire to worship the Lord, a desire to be a blessing to others, to self-sacrifice, that these are works of the Spirit in your life. Sometimes we're quick to identify the flesh and give credit where credit's due, but we're slow to identify the Spirit working in us to do godliness. Um, something to think about. Number 19, Hugh Seeger says, What advice would you give to me who struggles with apathy in my spiritual life? Um, here's my advice. For what it's worth, Hugh, you could struggle with apathy, but in a sense, you can you can be apathetic about it. <laughs> it can be healthy. See, because you could feel apathy about, I'm going to worship the Lord, but I just don't feel like it. I have a lack of emotions here. I'm just not feeling like worshiping God. But it's funny how strongly you could feel about not feeling very strongly and how you'll be all angsty about your apathy. And it's so funny that you can't just be apathy about your apathetic about your angst, which is what I would recommend. Um, I don't feel it, Lord, but I'm just dumb. And sometimes I don't feel things. I'm going to do it whether I feel like it or not, because sometimes obedience to God is like going to work. You know, the alarm goes off, you get up, you take a shower, you put your clothes on, you go to work. You're not like on your way to work going, I just don't feel like working today. You know, I don't really feel like it. You just see it as a responsibility, something you have to do. And that doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means that you're going to drag your own carcass kicking and screaming to do the thing that's right, whether you feel like it or not. And you can do that in worship and you can do that in study. You could do that in loving your bride your or your husband for that matter. You could, you could love people in ways that say, hey, I don't feel this way, but I will do this because it is honoring to God. And I think that it very much pleases the Lord when we honor him like that. So... My encouragement for apathy is don't let apathy bother you so much. Don't obsess about apathy. Don't live for your emotions, including when you're not feeling them. Joel Larson has a question. Do we need to feel bad for our sin when we repent or is knowing it's supposed to be wrong enough? My ex-girlfriend and I sin and I feel bad, but she doesn't. Um, I think that repenting is enough. Feeling bad is healthy. Right, so for some reason, this is interesting. Are we in question after question about this emotional thing? Emotions are optional but good. Optional but good. I want my emotions to be alongside me as I'm doing the right thing. But if they're not alongside me, I am not going to let them stop me from doing the right thing. I don't feel bad about this sin, but I know it's wrong, Lord. I should feel bad. I'm going to repent of it. Whatever's wrong with me that I don't feel bad, I'm sorry about that. I'm just going to do the right thing now. I think that's honoring God a lot more than I would repent, but I'm not really feeling it right now. I would worship, but I'm not feeling it right now. I would do something nice for my spouse, but I just don't feel it right now. It's like, you know, adults know these things don't matter. <laughs> right? I, I care. I want my emotions. There. They're good. They're just not necessary. Same thing here. Now, if for your girlfriend, if I was counseling her, not you, Joel, I would encourage her um, to pray that the Lord would soften her heart to the issue of sin. That she would just say um, in prayer, God, I recognize that for some reason I don't feel bad. But this sin that we've, we were, you know, having sexual sin together, this is, this is really bad. And I don't feel bad about it at all. Please break my heart. Show me, take the calluses off my heart and show me this sin for what it is. Help me see it. And I do think God generally does answer those types of prayers. I mean, he's, he's God, he's not a robot, so he does what he chooses. But I do think that that's a great prayer and I would pray it. And if you guys, anybody here, you're listening and you feel like you have no, no conviction of sin, you know, it's wrong, but you don't feel bad. Pray that the Lord would open your heart to it. Pray that he would pull that callus off and then he would help you to feel the way he feels about it. Think about the reality of the situation. But whether you feel it or not, repent. Just repent. Get right with the Lord. Do the right thing. 
walk forward. We, we live for the Lord. We live from faith. And emotions are just like a bonus when they come along. Um, there are times when our emotions fight us tooth and nail every step of the way. Paul's like, um, we're, we're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're confused. We're persecuted, right? We're, we're all those things. But, but yet there is this like bedrock of I'm going to trust in and follow and serve my king. And that is so healthy. Not only that, but when you can learn to operate without needing your emotions alongside, you do find that they tend to come alongside more often as like a nice little side benefit. I consider emotions the caboose of the train, <laughs> right? The head of the train, the engine car gets around the corner first, the caboose comes around last. Often you make a decision, you make a life change, you make a choice, and your emotions come around way later, but they eventually come around, and faith is the thing that needs to be making those choices, not our emotions. All right, you guys, that's going to be it for today. I just want to remind you, I'm going to be dealing with this Robbie Zacharias stuff, um, shocking, terrible... <sighs> Uh, Ravi Zacharias broke our hearts and we need to clean up the mess and that's what we're going to start doing on Monday this Monday at 1pm I hope to see you there um, unless you can't handle hearing about it but can I encourage you this don't defend him if you don't want to hear about it you don't want to talk about it that's fine but please 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 don't defend him there's nothing to defend anymore there's all the evidence is in there's more than one or two witnesses to prove a matter here so all right more coming on monday otherwise lord bless you guys keep your eyes on jesus in in no way does a tragedy like say robbie zacharias or something cause me to stumble in my faith in god it was never in him my faith tells me that i should expect these types of people to sometimes come up right wheats amongst the tares or wolves amongst the sheep it's shocking i didn't expect it he was really good at what he did and um yeah, it's tragic. It has no effect on my trust in Christ. This is why I cling to Jesus and not people. So, all right, you take care.